Thank you for that spontaneous applause. Uh, my name is Adrian Randolph, Dean of Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, tonight to this year's Philip M. and Ethel Klutznik Lecture in Jewish Civilization. This sounds incredibly loud. Uh, good, I'm glad you can hear me. Welcome. Uh, Philip and Ethel Klutznik generously endowed this lecture in 1986. For 31 years, this annual public event, sponsored jointly by the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Northwestern and the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan Chicago, has united scholars and the Jewish community in pursuit of a greater appreciation and understanding of Jewish civilization. Philip Klutznik served as US Secretary of Commerce and was awarded an honorary degree from Northwestern in 1984 the same year that the Crown Family Center for Jewish Studies was founded. In 2013, the Crown Family Center for Jewish Studies became the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies, thanks to a new gift we received from the Crown family that year. The center resides within Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and offers now approximately 40 courses per year that are available to students across the university. Uh, in history, literature, philosophy, political science, religion, and the Hebrew language. Uh, and it has about 20 affiliated faculty. The center also serves as an intellectual resource for the Chicago metropolitan area. Center faculty lecture frequently in public venues across the city, and the center's programs are well attended by the community at large. So it's now my pleasure to hand over the microphone to uh, Paula Harris, Associate Vice President of the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan Chicago, who has been involved with planning the Klutznik Lecture for over 15 years. Please give a warm welcome to Paula Harris. So I wanted to uh, thank you, Dean Randolph. Um, again, I'm Paula Harris, and I wanted to just welcome everybody on behalf of the Jewish United Fund of Metropolitan Chicago. We are very pleased to be partnering with Northwestern University for over 30 years. Um, and I can't believe it's been 15 years that I've been doing this. It feels like it's longer, actually. <laughs> but I'm not complaining because I have heard some fabulous lectures, okay, and met some extraordinary people over the time. Um, just to tell you just a little bit about JUF, um, we partner um, with Northwestern University in this lecture series, but we also um, have the Fiedler Hillel that's located on campus, which is a vibrant and one of the strongest Hillels um, in, the, in North America. And I know that my colleague Michael Simon is sitting right there, so. He's, he's really, he's done a great job with that. And I also wanted to make note that since uh, 2005, JUF um, working with the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences and the Crown Family for Jewish and Israel Studies has brought together um, or has brought over um, postdocs as part of the Israel Studies project. And I know one postdoc is sitting in the audience, he's, he's in the front row. And so we have two each year and they're really adding quite a bit to um, the, the knowledge base of uh, students as well as faculty. So I'm very pleased that we've been able to um, partner in this as well. Um, and then finally is this, is this lecture, which I think is a really wonderful partnership and opportunity for the community and the university to come together on, on a, a critical, on critical issues that are facing the Jewish community. Um, as I mentioned before, even though it seems like it's been a long time for me, but they've all been just fabulous um, speakers and I've come away with great knowledge and I know that this evening everybody will be truly inspired by our current, uh, our current lecture. So again, I wanted to welcome everybody and I hope you enjoy the evening. And now it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Professor Martin Eichenbaum, who I just met, so it was wonderful, director of the Crown Center for Jewish and Israel Studies. He's also the Charles Makos Professor of Economics and the co-director for the Center for International Microeconomics at Northwestern University. Thank you. Um, 
Good evening. Uh, the first question is, what's an economist doing in a place like this? But that's another topic. Um, on behalf of the center, um, I want to welcome everyone uh, to the Philip M. and Ethel Klutznik Lecture. And as you know, this year we're honored to have Ruth Gavison deliver that lecture. Um, I'd like to call on Claire Sufrin to formally introduce Professor Gavison. Claire is the Assistant Director of Jewish Studies, and in addition to her very important responsibilities in making the center work, uh, Claire is a distinguished scholar in her own right. Uh, she received her PhD from the Department of Religious Studies at Stanford University in 2008, and to show the different worlds we come from, I had to look up the definition of some of the words in the title of her thesis, but anyways. <laughs> Uh, anyways, I know for, I speak for everyone at the center when I say she plays an essential uh, role in, in the life of this enterprise. So, Claire, thank you. So I'm pretty sure the word was hermeneutics, uh, which uh, we can have a mini lecture uh, after tonight's, tonight's lecture. And, I don't understand the math that Marty does, so it all works out. Um, but thank you, thank you, Marty. And before I begin with formally introducing tonight's speaker, I've been designated as the one in charge of some logistics, so two logistical notes. First, please turn off your cell phones, if you haven't already. And second, as you came in, you should have received a small three by five note card and a very cute little golf pencil. And we're going to be collecting those at the end of the lecture to collate any questions that people may have. So in order to really make the most of our Q&A time, if you have a question, please jot it down on the note card. At the end of the talk, we'll have uh, ushers walking up and down the aisles pass to either side. And I will, this is going to be a speed reading uh, contest, I will quickly flip through the questions, look for themes that reappear and uh, try to identify what is, what is most pressing. And our hope is that will allow us to have um, as productive a Q&A period as possible. So that's it in terms of logistics. So um, tonight's speaker, tonight's Klutznik lecturer is Ruth Gavison. She is the Chaim H. Cohen Professor Emerita of Human Rights in the Faculty of Law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She holds degrees in law, in philosophy, and in economics from Hebrew University. And she clerked for Justice Benjamin Halevi on the Israeli Supreme Court in 1970 before earning her PhD in legal philosophy from Oxford University in 1975. In addition to her position at the Hebrew University, Professor Gavison has been a visiting professor at the Yale University Law School, a fellow at Princeton University's Center for Human Values, and at the Tikva Center at New York University, among other places. This spring, we are particularly honored that she has joined us as a visiting professor at the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies here at Northwestern, where we have already had the chance to engage uh, with her to absorb some of her passion for Zionism, political theory, legal studies, and human rights um, in the form of a few faculty seminars and student seminars. She's also had a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with some of our faculty as well as uh, with some of our students. And tonight, uh, we share her with you. As a widely published and well-regarded legal philosopher, Gavison's fields of teaching and research include legal theory, legal process, theories of adjudication, human rights and democracy, law and ethics, law and society, religion and state, and constitutionalism. In Israel, she has been a vocal participant in the most important legal issues and political issues facing the state, including the role of the Supreme Court, the relationship between secular and religious Jews, the state's lack of a constitution, and the rights of citizens and others in the state. In each of these areas, I should say as, as an aside, I'm gonna go off my written remarks for a moment. The best way that I can capture for you the wide breadth of Professor Gavison's interests and expertise is that if you Google her name looking for biographical facts, what you get is a series of articles in which she is quoted representing all of the topics of the day, basically anything that's been of importance in Israeli uh, legal development, in political issues. 
Everybody turns to her to get her opinion, and so that in and of itself is a biography. In each area in which she works and teaches, Professor Gavison takes an approach that is deeply informed by examples drawn from history and from conflicts that exist today. She does not shy away from the political challenges that face the state of Israel, but instead she aims always to contextualize these challenges and to use the tools of philosophy and legal theory to understand them better and to imagine what might be both ethically and realistically possible. She is known in Israel and internationally for her academic work and also for her active engagement in shaping Israeli society. Among other achievements, she was a founding member, chairperson, and president of the Association of Civil Rights in Israel, and she is a founder of Metzila, a center for Jewish, Zionist, liberal, and humanist thought, where she continues to serve as founding president and chair. She has been appointed to a number of public committees, including the Tzadok Committee on Freedom of the Press and the Vinograd Commission investigating the Second Lebanon War. Her most recent research engages with various dimensions of what it means for Israel to be a Jewish and democratic state. And that, of course, is the topic of tonight's lecture. It is hard to imagine a topic more suited to her mode of thinking or anything more important for us to think about with her. Please join me in welcoming Ruth Gavison as this year's Philip M. and Ethel Klutznik Lecturer in Jewish Civilization. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here tonight and to talk to you about uh, Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Often, the statement about the nature of Israel is presented as a question. The question is, can Israel be both Jewish and democratic? Because so many people say no, this is a contradiction in terms. The talk then takes the form of looking at these arguments, that this is an impossibility, and refuting them in a systematic way. Tonight, I thought it would be better to start with the affirmative declaration. I want to say that, yes, Israel is a state with a vision. It's not just a state that is supposed to give a home to all the citizens and residents living in it. It is a state that was conceived and founded to be the place in which Jews, whatever their definition of themselves as Jews, Jews can be people living in their own land as a majority community for the first time in their history after 2,000 years of dispersion. And the place for them to do that is the same land of Israel in which they had had political independence in the past. This is the vision of Israel that is the culmination of the movement Zionism that organized Jews at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century to seek renewed independence. And yes, Israel is a Jewish state, both by the uh, international documents that gave its credibility, but also by the partition that we are now celebrating 70 years of, and by its own declaration of independence. It is a Jewish state. We'll say more about what it means later. But Israel has two other components, at least two other components, to its vision. It's not only a Jewish state. It's a Jewish state committed also to democracy and to human rights for all in it. And the three elements of the vision are together a complex picture of what Israel is as a state and as a society striving for. And part of the challenge in the internal debate within Israel and the debate between Israel and its critics from the outside is the debate about this vision. And the strongest claim against this vision is that this vision is simply impossible. It's an oxymoron. 
It's something that is built on a contradiction in terms. It's in principle impossible. So Israel, if it wants to exist and wants to have a vision, must choose. It's either human rights and democracy, which many countries are committed to, or a particular Jewish state. You can't have both. And I would like to argue that this is not only a claim made in the context of a political conflict or a claim made uh, despite the ambiguity of the key terms, I think that this is a claim that doesn't really adequately understand that when a complex society has a vision, and the vision has more than one element, in most countries, when they have a vision, it includes more than one element, the relationships between these elements are always relationships of mutual reinforcement and creative tensions. In fact, mutual reinforcement and creative tensions exist even within each of these components. Anyone who studies democracy knows that there are internal tensions within the ideal of democracy. Is democracy majority vote? Or is democracy a form of political regime that allows people equal dignity and concern? What do we do when we have to make decisions in democracy? Should a democracy ban a party whose platform is anti-democratic? All these questions are within the ideal of democracy. And in order to have a functioning democracy, you have to do a lot of work in making decisions about the arrangements within democracy. Same with human rights. We are all for freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is very important for democracy. Same with freedom of association. But there are other rights too, like the right to privacy, for instance. Now, the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression often conflict because my right to keep my private affairs private is in conflict with your right to say what you know about me and to seek information about me so you can say to other people things about me that I don't want said. Now, if there are two rights here, expression and privacy, then we need to do a lot of work within human rights in order to deal with them together. Another obvious example is democracy is freedom of expression, participation, equality. What do we do about a person whose argument is that we shouldn't treat all people as equal? Do we let a people or a party say that? This is a problem with equality. But if we don't let them say that, what about our commitment to free speech and the marketplace of ideas? Anyway, so many people agree and concede that democracy and human rights are related and have mutually supportive elements and also some tensions. But then they say these two commitments are general. They are colorblind. They are not particular. Judaism, on the one, other hand, is a particular commitment. It distinguishes between Jews and non-Jews, between members and non-members. How can a state which is committed to a particular group in some way, in any way, be consistent or compatible with democracy and human rights? And I think this is an opportunity to look again into democracy and human rights and understand how individuals, groups, societies, and states really work. Because I would like to put to you the idea that a healthy, robust state is a state that has a strong society. A strong society is a free society. A free society is a society that allows people in it to be different. But a healthy society is also a society that connects individuals together. 
a healthy society must go in a way between individualism, respect for any individual, so each individual, and solidarity, and responsibility, between the private and the public. And each great culture, religious, nationalist, any other group culture, negotiates this basic tension between individuals, families, tribes, communities. In states, a relatively late phenomenon are the political frameworks within these human groups seek to work together. Now, states are built on societies. Most old human groupings were more or less homogeneous, and there were struggles about territorial control of a land, and they tended to be then the land of the, this tribe and that tribe, and then there were conquests and other tribes. In our modern world, we don't have that. And democracy, which is a relatively new modern idea, not the Athenian Greek idea of old, new democracy is built on what we called a civic society, the group of all citizens. And in most states, the groups of all citizens are not homogeneous. They don't only have, as all groups have, class differences between people who are richer and people who are poorer, or people who are more you know, connected and people who are less connected, or people who have occupations that are more lucrative and people who have occupations that are less lucrative. These exist within all ethnic, religious, cultural groups. But we are talking about states that now have different ethnic, religious, linguistic, cultural groups. And one of the purposes of democracy is to allow states who have societies with rifts among their groups to function together to promote the public interest of the state itself. So in these states that we're talking about, which are not homogeneous, we have a tension, always we have a tension, between the identity of the civic community, some people call it the civic nation, the demos, the people who are members of the political community, and in democracy, they have freedom to participate and equal citizenship, irrespective of their membership in any other non-civic group. So a democracy is a society built of individuals who are equal citizens, irrespective of their affiliations, but who also maintain is very important parts of their identity, these other non-civic affiliations. And a healthy society is a society in which the citizenry can invoke, can rely on the resources of the civic solidarity, of the political sense of patriotism, and on the community, other affiliations that give them deeper senses of meanings and belongings. And one of the strengths of American democracy, as de Tocqueville mentioned when he studied American democracy so many years ago, is its ability to connect the political structure of the state with a very powerful civil society which has very strong freedom of association, but also de facto associations living in all kinds of levels and communities, religious communities and local communities and municipalities and states. Federalism is an exercise in unity and solidarity of all within a system of 
structural differences. So in many senses, a society is the society of its shared citizenship and its political institutions, but also the society of the autonomous groups that continue to flourish within it and form together a part of the political community. And the political community that enriches and allows and facilitates these groups is a stronger political community because of its imminent pluralism. Now, this works more or less in America. There are many countries in which this does not work because the ethnic groups and the religious groups are fighting. They undermine the political solidarity and they put their own religious, ethnic, cultural, historical solidarity first. And when this happens, either democracy is strong enough to include all of them in a working political community, or there is a civil war or another war, and the groups then seek to form political communities that have either exclusive, but more often majority status for one cultural religious groups. I don't want to go into the history of that, but the history of Zionism and of Israel is the result of many, many years, generations, in which Jews did not have a political community. They were dispersed. Some people said it was a religious punishment. Some people said it was a political failure. It doesn't matter now. They did manage to not lose their identity. And this was a joint achievement of their own internal resources and the fact that the host communities usually did not let them fully assimilate. But they did maintain a distinct Jewish identity over time. And primarily this Jewish identity, when they didn't have political independence in the country, was religious, as most human societies were. But Jews were often persecuted, and they faced individual and collective dangers. And Zionism is the modern movement that says, A, Judaism is not only a religion, it is a religion, it's not only a religion. Some Jews want to keep their Jewish identity despite the fact that they, with enlightenment and secularism, have decided that they don't want to be religiously observant. But, and some of them don't want to remain Jews, but some of them want to remain Jews. And the condition for them remaining Jews requires that they have a measure of self-determination, that they are not always and every place a minority commute, community controlled by others for its defense, for its culture, for its vision. And Zionism is the movement that says Judaism is not only a religion, it's bad for Jews, and it's bad for Judaism as a tradition, as a civilization, to be in a situation where Jews are always a minority. And the solution for Jews is, therefore, to have at least one place in which they do have full responsibility for an independent political and social life. And this place, Zionism, is in Zion. All these presuppositions were highly controversial among Jews and, of course, raised quite a lot of disagreement and conflict with non-Jews. But Israel, as I said, is the culmination of this national movement. Now, the idea of Zionism is that Jews should have self-determination. The idea of democracy is for the political, for the group living in a certain territory to help to have self-determination. So in a way, the inspiration for both Zionism and all forms of nationalism and democracy are the same source. 
The source is the wish of a group to have a measure of self-rule, to have a measure of autonomy, to have a measure of being responsible for the decision they make so that when they make decisions about social welfare or about development or about social justice, they make these decisions not merely based on political or economic theory. They make these decisions as part of their membership in an ongoing cultural and meaningful community. So Zionism and democracy are both motivated by the same power, as are anti-imperialistic and anti-colonial movements, which are movements who say, basically, we live in this territory. You came from afar to exploit us and to control us. We don't want to be governed by a foreign ruler. We want to be governed by ourselves, OK? So the idea of democracy and a Jewish affiliation is natural for a community, a political community, that doesn't think it is built on privatizing all the non-civic features of people. Now, there are some countries and some political theories that think that the only way for a democracy to be is by being liberal and neutral and privatizing everyone. So that there is no mediation between the democratic state and each individual. Each individual comes as an equal individual citizen to the state, and there is no mediation between them. And the individuals will make choices, and they will choose the representatives, and there will be a democracy by the people, of the people, for the people. However, people don't come as individuals. No one lives on an island. People come in communities, and the communities are what gives them their depth and resilience. So that even America, whose rhetoric has been most profoundly a rhetoric of cosmopolitan individual non-mediated citizenship with a constitution that is the civil religion of America, even America, when you look deep down at it, is a very community-based, very community-based country and society. And in fact, many liberal thinkers think that this vision of a neutral, totally privatized society is not only impossible, the society must have a language. We don't speak Esperanto anymore. So we have a particular language. It's a language of a people with a culture and a history. So it's not only that this is impossible, it's also that in a liberal sense, this is undesirable. Because it does not let groups of individuals pursue within the state the kind of internal sources of strength that make them people who understand the creative, constructive tension between individualism, personal self-fulfillment, and membership, responsible membership in a community. Now, the vision of democracy in America is, as I said, the vision of government of the people, by the people, for the people. Representatives in America and in the classical theories of democracies are not people who are maximizing the interests of their groups. They often act that way. That's why we become so cynical about some of our institutions. But the theory is a theory of serving elites. And the serving elites are elites coming from a community. They're not, you know, coming from nowhere. They come from a community. They are the leaders of communities. And as leaders of communities, 
they are leaders of social, cultural, religious, linguistic, historical groups. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in every democratic society and in every non-democratic society, the robustness of society is its ability to be open to pluralism, to variety, to see the richness of different perspectives, but also to have the powers that connect people to their traditions and allow these different traditions to function together politically within a state. Now, the vision of the state of Israel is precisely that. And all the international discussions of Zionism and all the internal debates about Zionism among Jews are about how to translate this need that Jews have to have one place in which the public culture is Jewish and they fight with each other very, very strongly about what Judaism means today. Is it just a religion, religion cum nation, only a nation? What are the implications about marriage and divorce laws, regulations, days of rest, Jewish law? All these are hotly debated among Jews everywhere and among Jews in Israel. The Jewish state is not, as some people claim, a Jewish theocracy. The Jewish state is also not an exclusive Jewish ethnic state. It's not at all like that, because Jews have always, even when they were independent, asking the questions of what should be the life of Jews and how Jews should relate to non-Jews living around them. Jews never lived, you know, <laughs> on their own. There were always other peoples around with the Jews. And the questions of how do we deal with these other people is a constant question. Now, Judaism, one of the nice and interesting things about Judaism is that while Judaism is not a missionary religion at all, it's, if anything, the opposite of that, the vision of Israel, the messianic vision of Judaism, is not of having one group of people, universal salvation, with everyone seeing the same light. The vision of Israel for messianic times is that, yes, people do see the same light and do recognize the same God, but they come to this recognition as different peoples. They remain different peoples. They remain peoples who enjoy their difference, not because it's superior, not because it's the only way to be. They enjoy the difference because difference is good. So Jews don't want to be alone in the world. They don't want everyone to be Jewish like some religions do. They want people to know how to live together as different people. And at least many, many people who were thinking of Israel as a place for Jews to have such domination wanted Israel to be that kind of a place, to bring light onto the nations in the sense of showing how Israel can be democratic, equal to its non-Jews, tolerant to all Jews, whoever they are and whatever their attitudes to religion, and a group that has an international cosmopolitan vision, but not of a one world government of individuals who are not mediated into groups, but a place where groups exist forever, but they can exist in peace, in some kind of eternal peace. Okay, so this is part of Israel. And I think it's quite clear from that picture, not only that there is no inconsistency between Jews living in a democratic country, that there are many resources within Judaism who would think that democracy is actually a very good political way to be. Now, as I said, there are two main challenges to Israel as a Jewish democratic state committed to human rights. One is the external challenge, 
mainly by Arabs, but not only by Arabs, saying that the whole thing is impossible. The internal challenge is now joined with that challenge. And the internal challenge says, even if in principle you're right, the realities of Israel are such that it is not democratic. It is very Jewish, no question about it, but it's not democratic, or as some of my Arab friends say, it's democratic to the Jews, but it's Jewish to the Arabs. I don't want to, you know, start arguing again. I mean, this is not about polemics. I do want to say two things. Israel as a Jewish state is the idea that for Jews to be able to maintain their culture and enjoy physical and cultural identity security, they must have not only autonomy, not only self-rule, as Jews can have and often do have in many other places in the world, they must also have a state in which, A, they can defend themselves physically and culturally, and B, in which they can deny the option that Jews choose or must choose anywhere else. And this is the choice to privatize their Jewish identity, to make their Jewish identity something that is done in the home, in the family, in the synagogue, in the community, not something that is part and parcel of what we do as people who exercise power. Now, we live in the West. The West, despite the fact that there are many debates about separation of state and church, the West is, until now, based on very deep culture, cultural Christian elements, even if not religious and revivalist and fundamentalist religious elements. Now, Christianity as a culture is a culture that tells believers, but also people who have the Christian tradition that are not necessarily observers, it tells them a whole lot of attitudes and ways of reasoning about how to go about dealing with political issues. And now I come back to human rights, because democracies are not universal. Democracies are for particular political communities. And as I suggested, in democracies, the self-determination of the majority is often not only civic majority, but also ethnic, cultural, historical, religious majority. So nation states or religious-based states are states that do have a special connection to a particular culture. This doesn't mean that they discriminate against non-members. This doesn't mean that they don't give full freedom of religion. America is one of the most Christian countries among the Christian countries, but it also has constitutional separation of state and state and church institutional. It's a very religious country. But in the European countries that are much more secularized, there is often establishment of churches. Many European countries have established churches. In fact, most European countries have established churches. But it doesn't mean that there is no freedom of religion and there is no you know, mosques and Jews and you know, all kinds of religious communities. So, so <clears throat> the idea that we can have democracy depends on the nature of the particular society and the wish of Jews to have a majority within their state suggests that they understand that they need the reinforcing power between being a majority so that in a democratic society, it will be natural and acceptable 
for them to have more weight in making some of the decisions that will be made by the state, some. But so let's move quickly to human rights. Human rights are not about particular political communities, territorial communities. Human rights are about all humans. This is a universal idea. However, since it is a universal ideal, it must be embedded in all human cultures. And indeed, it is. And when the United Nations, after the Second World War, realized that lack of respect for human rights was responsible for some of the atrocities of Second World War, they started this move that culminated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, December, 10th December, 1948. And this was a major work in which people of various countries stood together to try and formulate, establish a document that will identify what the international community sees as human rights. And in order to do that, they went to not only states, which were critical, but to also cultural religious communities. And the document that they have created is a document based on the composed insights of religious leaders, political adversaries, social and economic movements with different visions of how society can and should work, civil and political rights of the West, social and economic rights of the communist bloc. But all of this was based on a real understanding that yes, there was a minimal agreement in all cultures about basic human rights. Now, when we want to protect human rights in a particular community, say the United States, or Israel, or Egypt, there are two ways of doing it, going about it. One way is to say there is international documents of human rights, there are covenants and the declaration and the NGOs and the human rights movement. And when we want to promote and protect human rights, we should look to them for guidance about what human rights are. But the other way is different, because this way says, you, the demos, you, the communities, you don't have a sense of human rights. We, the international community, are going to tell you what human rights are and what they require. And we don't trust you to do the right thing, because you may want to do bad things to minorities, and we, from the international place will tell you what they are. But then people often say, we came to have a democracy because we wanted self-determination. We wanted to be the sources of the decision about our country. And if you are not going to let us articulate our own understanding of human dignity, of equality, of men created in the image of God or man. If you want us to do it, you should relegate to us also the power and the duty to look within our cultural resources and do human rights. Okay, so I want to finish by saying why the vision of Israel as Jewish, democratic, and committed to human rights is not only possible, it's not only what more or less exists, it's not perfect, there are many things that need to be done, but there is a commitment to these threesome in most of the political social elites in Israel. I want to explain that this is not only good for the Jews. I'm not talking about democracy and the state of Israel as the state of majority rule for the majority of Jews. A, there are many, many subgroups within the Jews, and they have terrible fights. And, and uh, so we have a coalition of minorities rather than majority minority. But it's not only that. A state to take good care of its citizens and residents, all of them, must be effective. This is something that some modern theories of democracies forget. They are so afraid of 
the concentration of power and the abuse of power, that they only look for checks and balances that will limit power. Limiting power is very important. But we all will also need energetic government to take care of all the very, very serious challenges that modern societies and states face. A state to take good care of its society, inclusive of everyone, must be an effective state committed to the welfare of all who live in it. A wise government will always know that its stability depends on a social contract between it and all the groups within it, that the groups will feel in some way partners in the success of the state. If you're going to have groups that are alienated from the state because they feel they're just the victims, exploited, the excluded, this is a recipe for disaster. Now, in the Middle East, unfortunately, we can see this happen. The danger in the Middle East is not only tyrannical autocratic states. I think what we have seen in the last decade is that sometimes tyrannical states are better than failed states. Because in Libya and in Syria and in Iraq, what we now see is not tyrannical non-democratic states, which they were. We see failed states that cannot guarantee their personal safety, not to mention the cultural identity and the religious differences of the communities living in them. This is a disaster. The Jewish state, that is Israel, is demanded, required by some pundits, Arabs and some Jews, to give up its Jewish distinctness. The idea is that this will allow it to be equally concerned with all. I think it should be equally concerned with all, even when it is a Jewish state. And I think that if it gives up its Jewishness, it's going to give up one of the elements that makes it a successful, stable, flourishing state to the benefit, physical, social, cultural, and political of all communities within it. I'm not paternalistically saying that, ha, 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 the situation of the Arabs in Israel is much better than the situation of Arabs in many other countries, and this is good enough. No, it's not good enough. This is not the point. The point is that the Arabs in Israel do not want a state that is neutral and privatizes all the non-civic affiliations of their citizens. They don't want a Jewish state because they want an Arab state. They don't want a Jewish state because they want a liberal, neutral state. This is not the real alternative. There are many Arab states. If Israel becomes another Arab state, I think that despite the good wishes of many people in the international community, I don't think that anyone will come out to protect the Jews. So the Jews need a state mechanism to protect themselves. And the Jews will be tested. And they knew that they will be tested by the way they treat the countries and the people around them and the Arabs living within them. And I think they are seriously committed, and they should be committed, to Israel being a democracy, committed to human rights, and a Jewish state. And this is what gives it its power to resist the forces that are constantly challenging its right to exist at all, and if this doesn't sound so nice to say that this is a country that should be there, as some people still say, and that's still members of the family of nations, but it's much more elegant to say, no, 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 we accept Israel, it's okay, but it shouldn't be and shouldn't demand to be recognized as a state which has 
any particular affinity or affiliation to Jews. I resist that, and I hope that you can see some of the reasons why it's right, not only for Jews to resist that, but for the international order to resist that. Because if you are going to make Israel an Arab state on the strength of an argument that no state should be a nation state of any particular group, you are showing a total misunderstanding of the Middle East, but not only the Middle East, a total misunderstanding of what makes societies and state important. Because the challenge of the West today, the West that is the source of this demand, and I'm not talking about the Arab demand that I think is tactical, but the demand among some liberal Jews and liberal American Jews and non-Jews that Israel should give up its Jewishness because no state can be Jewish and have equal concern and respect, I think this idea shows that they don't really have a full understanding of the internal dynamics of their own society. Because American society as it is now, it's a political system based on polit politics of identity. This may be bad, this may be good, but it's a fact of the matter. And the politics of identity may be dangerous if it undermines civic cohesion or civic solidarity. But you cannot deal with factions, said Madison in Federalist 10, by trying to get rid of them. Factions are the power of what makes individuals and societies work. You must enlist those groups to your purposes. And in Israel, I think the achievements of Israel, which are very impressive, despite of its serious challenges, the achievements of Israel are built on the fact that it has built a credible combination of the energy of Jews who want to have a place in which they can debate in a political independent community the modern meaning of Jewishness and to offer a way of Jewish life that undertakes this challenge and the commitment that this state takes to be democratic, vibrantly democratic, to be a free society, a society in which every opinion is heard, and a society that is committed to maintain this democracy and this freedom in order to permit Jews a place in the world which can be their national home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. If uh, anybody has a question they'd like to ask, if you could jot it down, or if you've already jotted it down, please uh, pass it to either end of the row, and we have people coming along to collect the cards. While that is happening, I'm going um, to ask a question of my own, if you don't mind. And uh, it has to do with the question of um, the role of Jews being the, mi the majority in Israel, it's the demographic uh, question, which you know, I know uh, demographers can take uh, different, uh, can read the data in different ways, but one of the questions is comparative birth rates and whether we can assume that in 20 years or 50 years or 100 years that Jews will numerically be the majority population in Israel and how that affects uh, your argument. You know, uh, we, we live in interesting times, but times are always interesting. And uh, there are always people who say that, you know, democracy is at the end, the world is going to end. There is a lot of triumphalism too, but there is also doom. And about Jews, there is... So demographics, 
were seen to be a problem for Israel from time immemorial. They could never establish a majority. They, didn't, they weren't a majority. It seems now that if Israel does not annex the occupied territories, that is, if Israel continues to maintain the unstable and not happy situation under which uh, uh, it controls effectively uh, uh, the West Bank with a large number of people who are not participating in the political decisions made within Israel, in the settlements and all that. If Israel does that, as Lebanon did, Lebanon had big eyes, it wanted more territory, it thought it will be forever a majority Christian community, it's gone. But if Israel doesn't heed that and it creates a reality of two-state solution where the claim that all Palestinians should be included in the Israeli demos, then I think, yes, the Jewish majority will be a problem, and this will weaken Israeli democracy in a very, very bad way. I don't want to say it will be the end of it, but, but you know, I don't know if it's much worse than what the Americans had with slavery, blah, 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 and with no women, blah, blah, so, but it's going to be bad. However, if there is going to be an arrangement under which Israel remains more or less within what we call small Israel, uh, uh, the demographic picture is in fact uh, quite stable. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so I, I am very quickly trying to uh, sort these questions and I would say that one theme that is returning is people citing various examples of inequality within Judaism and primarily inequality in traditional structures of Judaism between men and women. And so how would you address that as you argue that uh, democracy and uh, Jewish values and ideas can work together? This is a fascinating subject, and, and uh, it's an ongoing debate within Israel and obviously uh, uh, with the com Jewish community outside Israel. So Israel <coughs> insists, has always insisted, and insists today, and is not a Jewish theocracy. Jewish law per se is not binding in most areas of Israeli life. It is binding in matters of personal status, marriage, and divorce, but this is a residue of the Ottoman system, and it's true for all religions, not only for the Jews. So this is something that in Israel exists for everyone, and most people dislike it. And actually, when the British came in to start the mandatory period, they asked Jews and Arabs what they wanted on marriage and divorce, and the Jews said, we want civil, civil law. And the Arabs said, no, 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 we want religious law. And today, when there is a Jewish majority for civil marriage in Israel, the Arabs join forces with the Jewish religious parties to prevent this change in the law. But this doesn't matter, because it's important and it's bad, but it's not the point. Something very interesting is happening, because Israel has a large, religious, observant community. One of the interesting things about freedom of religion, which is a very important liberal democratic right, is that we need to take religion seriously, especially if you're not religious. Now, for religious people who are really religious, not just, you know, light religious, for religious people, they need to do what their religion demands. And Judaism, in this sense, is a very expansive religion. It's not only about worship and prayers. It's a lot, a lot, it's about social political matters too. So what should we do if there is a question, a political question, and there is a debate whether what the government wants to do is against Jewish law? For instance, some people are saying that Jewish law prohibits giving sovereignty over any parts of the land of Israel to a foreign rule. Now, if this is the case, then how can a Jewish state even consider a compromise on territories? So Israel made it very clear from the very beginning, including in its Declaration of Independence, that Jewish law is not binding on the state of Israel. Decisions in the state of Israel are made by its political institutions. And the political institutions, the relevant political institutions are, you know, Knesset, Parliament, uh, government, courts, all kinds of, you know. However, this is not the end of the matter. Because if you do have a large religious community whose idea of what they may and should do 
is dictated to some extent authentically by their religion, then the commitment to freedom of religion means that you need to respect that interpretation. So there is a question among secular Jews, myself included, whether we should enter the debate about what Jewish law says. Because some people say, well, since it doesn't bind us, we don't really know much about it. So they should argue about that. It doesn't bind us, we don't care. I disagree. It doesn't bind us. But in order to understand my society, my demos, my people, I need to understand what these people are talking about. And if there is an interpretation of Jewish law that I find is totally inadequate to the challenges of the time, despite the fact that I'm not observant, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not observant, but I care about my tradition. I am a great believer in the Jewish tradition. I think it has enormous powers of regeneration. I'm angry with some religious establishments that insist that we should not change anything. I'm also angry with my, some of my liberal friends, or including reformed Jews who are liberal uh, Jews, who think that tradition is nothing and we could just do everything anew. And no, it's a serious business. It's a legal, cultural system. It has its own ways of progressing. But I insist, and this is part of what I mean by my Jewishness, I insist that despite the fact that I'm not bound by religious law as such, it's part of my tradition. I am not willing to let religious people have a monopoly over the interpretation of my culture. Judaism is my culture as much as theirs. True, they have an observant, more ancient uh, uh, interpretation. I don't want to go into that debate, but I am not going to, in the life of the modern Jewish people in modern times, let some interpretations of Jewish law conclude the matter conclusively. I would like to use the fact that we need in Israel to grapple with these issues as one of the major forces of renewal within the Jewish tradition. The renewal that Jews had when Jewish law had to deal with reality until two or three hundred years ago when Jews were governed by Jewish law is lost now because we have civil law. I want to revive the internal debate within Judaism, and I have a great hope that we can see unbelievable new creativity within Judaism itself. Okay. I'll clap for that one as well. We have time for uh, one more question, and there are, are many excellent uh, ones here, but I'm gonna try to combine two themes in, into one. And one of the, the questions that's, that's emerging is how should the state of Israel as a Jewish, as a democratic state, respond to accusations from the international community that it violates human rights, in particular in the occupied territories? And I'm gonna tack on to that. And uh, on behalf of those of you who asked this question, are there views that should be against the law to express in the state of Israel? Going back to one of the early questions you brought up yourself, does a democracy have to allow a political party that is anti-democratic? What are the, the parties that should be so, forbidden so you, in you, Israel? You, I am you, this is two one questions. last question that and is I'm really let, three different yes. questions. Well, yes, it I, is. I, I will let I, you answer whichever handle, parts uh, uh, you would well, like. I'll, I'll try to be to be uh, to be to be very short. Well, uh, well. <laughs> the question on banning political parties, I think, is a marvelous proof banning political parties that are anti-democratic. In fact, Israeli law does ban parties which are anti-democratic, racist, or deny that Israel is the nation state of Jews. So it has this element into the debate of can a democracy uh, 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 bar, or ban, or not allow a party uh, that says that, and this is a very serious, <laughs> I, it's very difficult to, uh, to deal with these questions in this way because you know, the, 
so many books and articles have been written about this particular question, it's very, very difficult. I think it can be justified if the interpretation of the Israel is a Jewish nation state of Jews is not that Israel must indeed be the nation state of Jews, but it's legitimate for Israel to be the nation state of Jews. I think that people within Israel who deny the right of Jews to have a state, not the question whether this particular state that is Israel should democratically maybe decide that it doesn't need to be a Jewish state any longer. That's a decision it may make. I hope it won't. I'll fight against it, but it may make it. This is fine. And you can advocate that as far as I'm concerned. But you cannot advocate that the present vision of the state is a violation of human rights. It's totally unacceptable because this undermines the choice of the present demos of the state, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the legitimate choice. So, so if you interpret it this way, I think it's relevant. Anyway, the only party in the history of Israel that was banned was Kahana and its aftermath. No Arab party, including parties that do precisely what I just said should not be allowed, run in the elections and sit in parliament. So in this sense, it's not a real practical issue. Uh, uh, but in general, I think it is justified. And you must understand it's a problem of history and politics. You don't have a law like this here because you have a political system that until now hasn't created this challenge. Now you may be thinking other things. This is, but probably you can change, you cannot change. This is interesting, I'm not going to talk about that. But, 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 but in Germany, of course, they do have a law like that. And in, they actually have used it. So, and the Europeans are enforcing laws like that. Anyway, so, so the other question is the human rights in the occupied territories. <laughs> well, you know, the occupied territories is the, or one of the most, the hardest political questions in Israel, the hardest. My perception of it is that it's a tragic situation. It really is tragic. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I, I, I am becoming more pessimistic about it all the time. And I now see it very similar to the problem of slavery in the United States. The United States hoped to deal with slavery in a peaceful, gradual way. I think many people in Israel and in the international community hoped that the post-67 problem could be solved in that way, and Oslo was an attempt to do that. But Oslo is not now very relevant, and we face a different situation, and I am not sure what can be done. Maybe your president is going to create some new miracles there, but this is not the point. So now there is occupation as a fact. So many people say the occupation is illegal. Not true. Occupation is an arrangement under international law which is a result of war. The Six Days War was a defensive war. I don't think there is a major debate about that. Israel captured those territories. And the idea of occupation is that it's a temporary arrangement until some arrangement can be made that will take care of the issues that created the war to begin with and will create a stable, new, peaceful solution. This hasn't happened. Some people say it's only because of Israel. Some people say it's only because of the Palestinians. I usually believe that when you don't do something, it takes two to tango. It takes two to tango. And these two don't seem to be very eager or willing to agree. If Israeli and Palestinians both thought that their best interest is served by an agreement, we would see an agreement. Unfortunately, this is not the case. So now, I agree with you, or with the question, that OK, so occupation is there. And now the question is, what about human rights? No, the answer is there should be an attempt to deal with the human rights of these people. This is a long time. It's 50 years. It's a very, very long time. It creates kind of practices you need. And I think in many ways, 
the situation, not in Gaza. Gaza is completely different. Israel doesn't control Gaza anymore. But in the West Bank, I think the basic situation is acceptable. There is a serious amount of self-rule. There is a lot of autonomy. The situation can be better. But there is, obviously, this is unstable. This is not good. This needs to be worked through. Part of the problem with the occupation is that you hope to have a final status agreement. If you don't have a final status agreement, and I think, unfortunately, now you can't have it, aiming at the final status agreement means that you are creating expectations and you don't do what needs to be done on the ground to have a better, stable life for all. This is one thing. But the other, I think, uh, tragedy is that Human rights is distinct from politics, OK? But the question of managing the occupation after 50 years with so much interdependence between the West Bank and Israel in terms of water um, uh, importation, with the labor market, I mean, it's, it's really hard to imagine that these two entities are distinct. And there is obviously the question of the settlements and the movements. So, the, you, it's very, very difficult to identify human rights issues from general management issues. So yes, Israel should protect human rights. And I think to, to some extent it tries. And I think there is something that is interesting here about Israeli democracy. There is a huge debate in Israel now about this organization called Shuvrim Shtika, Breaking the Silence. This is an organization that says that Israel is violating human rights, that the use of force, military force, is totally undisciplined, that this is war crimes, and that this needs to be done. And the moral cost of the occupation is so high that they have undertaken to try and expose what Israel is doing in the West Bank in order to persuade Israelis that it's a must political and moral, to end the occupation yesterday, and if not yesterday, then tomorrow. Now, the question whether we should end the occupation is a very controversial question in Israel. There is a majority, and has been a majority among Israelis, Jews, not to mention the Arabs, that supports uh, withdrawal from most of the territories for peace. I think part of the problem with the recent decade of attempts to get an agreement are that many Israelis, especially after Gaza, don't think that there is a peace in the deal as it is now. A, because there is no wish to have a deal, but B, even if some people do wish to have a deal, they cannot implement. So you cannot really have a deal. So now the question becomes, is it right if you cannot have a deal to have a political platform that says we should end the occupation unilaterally now. Now, many people who would like to end the occupation, partly because of the demographic reason I was talking about earlier, say, we just can't afford to do it now. We just can't do that now. So I think part of the reason that the left parties in Israel are not more successful in elections, which after all in democracy is the major way in which you gain political power, I think part of the reason that the left is not more successful is not that the people like the message of the right and that they want to live forever on their swords. It's they don't think that what they are offering, stop the occupation now, is a realistic political platform. So, so I think this is, I said at the beginning, this is really tragic. This is a bad thing. But it doesn't mean that if this is a bad situation, the right thing to do is to just say, OK, let's get out of the West Bank tomorrow. I don't want a failed state in the West Bank. I think it would be best, terrible for Israel, terrible for the Jews in Israel, very bad for the Arabs in Israel, unbelievably bad for the Palestinians, and very bad for the whole region. 
I think it's totally irresponsible to even think that all we are talking about here is human rights and morality. And I hope, I hope that it will soon be a better situation and we can then talk about human rights and ending the occupation in a much more realistic and simple way. Wonderful. Please join me in thanking Ruth Gavison.